Hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone had a really happy holidays and got what they wanted. Um, I'm going to show you what I got in the way of books. I think if I counted correctly, I got about 21 from three bookstores around San Antonio called Half Price Books. Every year after Christmas, they always have a 20% off sale. And I think there are five or six around uh, the city, and I went to three of them. So uh, in no particular order will I be showing you the books because I sort of um, sorted them randomly. So um, I'll just show you what I got, I think about 21 of them, like I said. Uh, the first one is um, a book that I just heard of really recently, actually, but that sounded um, interesting because I'm interested in this sort of cultural criticism in the American vein. Uh, this is called... Uh, uh, Mass Cult and Mid Cult, Essays Against the American Grain by Dwight MacDonald, uh, with an introduction by Louis Menon. And it's, of course, one of those uh, wonderful NYRB imprints. And Dwight MacDonald was a, an American cultural writer and cultural critic uh, that you don't hear about too much anymore. And if you do hear about him, it's, it's certainly in relation to Mass Cult and Mid Cult. But there are some other essays included in the book, too. Um, Louis Menand also happens to be the, the guy who wrote um, the book about uh, American pragmatism. Uh, the, the, the Metaphysics Club, I think, is the right name. I'm Metaphysicians Club, which is really a spectacular book if you're interested in Charles Sanders Peirce and William James and all of those people. But anyway, something that um, I was interested in and uh, sort of bought on a whim. I don't know where I'm going to stack all these books because there's so damn many of them, but we'll see as we go along. Um, a couple of these books in this huge pile here I admittedly uh, didn't know much about, but bought for uh, sort of on a whim because I recognized just the name or, or the writer's name. The, the title or the writer's name, or they were just a steal, a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. This was because I recognized the writer's name. Um, this book actually won the James Tate uh, Memorial Prize a while back. It's called uh, On the Black Hill by Bruce Chapman. Bruce Chapman was a British travel writer and actually happened to be one of the uh, first people to, uh, the, one of the first British writers, well-known British writers, to die of AIDS back in the back in the 80s. And uh, it won a fairly prestigious prize, and I recognize his name. And I haven't found any of his travel writing, at least at an affordable price. But um, this is a novel, and it looked really interesting. And I think it's one of those new penguin well it is one of those new penguin ink editions you know that they're coming out with so next up another novel by Eudora Wealthy uh, this one is uh, called Losing Battles uh, Eudora Wealthy is uh, someone I don't have too much experience with. Um, I know her as an American Southern writer. Um, I tried reading The Optimist's Daughter about six or eight years ago, and I think I might have just been, you know, either not in the right mood or um, just too immature to, to understand much. And it's even much, much shorter than this. <laughs> but I saw this, and I thought maybe I'd appreciate something that was a bit longer. So I decided to pick it up. Um, next up is a little tiny novel that who, uh, that I recognized by name, but it was also a dollar. <laughs> it's a uh, uh, Vathic by William Beckford. Beckford was actually a British writer, but he wrote this in French, and then someone else translated it into English. Uh, Beckford was born in 1760. And he wrote this when he was 22 or 24 years old, and it's supposed to be 
uh, sort of dystopian, almost science fiction-like gothic novel. And it's uh, supposed to be up there in quality with uh, Frankenstein and um, The Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, uh, both of which I really enjoyed. So I thought this would be uh, good too. Next is a book by um, W.G. Sebald. Uh, Sebald is a, a writer, one of whose books I re reviewed on here before. I reviewed um, uh, Austerlitz, about a man wandering Europe, sort of in search of his own past, despite himself, sort of novels. And I also have The Immigrants, which I don't think I've mentioned that I have before, but uh, I got another one, uh, The Rings of Saturn. I don't know too much about it, but I recognized his name, and I was blown away so much by um, by Austerlitz that I, I pretty much want to read whatever I can find that Siebold has written. Uh, next up is a book by uh, someone whose work I really admire. Um, his name is uh, Graham Robb. He's a, he, it's, it's a biography of Balzac. It's just called Balzac. Graham Robb wrote um, a couple of interesting books. Um, goodness, maybe, maybe it'll mention the title of the one I'm thinking of in the front. And then maybe it won't. Of course, it, it, it never will when I, when I want to find what book I'm trying to mention and it becoming all flustered. Um, anyway, um, it was about homosexuality in the 19th century. And uh, he's also written a book about uh, the geography of Paris uh, called something like The Geographic Discovery of Paris or something. Both looked really interesting, um, and he's just a really literate, uh, obviously a Francophile, and um, I love Balzac, so I thought I would pick this up. Also very reasonably priced uh, on the discount shelves, two or three dollars, I think. This next one is a book of history um, about a, a pretty interesting part of the world, a, a newer, well, new and old, I guess, part of the world. Uh, it's uh, the Balfour Declaration, uh, The Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict, by Jonathan, I don't know if you can see with the glare, Jonathan Schneer, S-C-H-N-E-E-R. And it's basically about uh, the Balfour Declaration, and if you know what the Balfour Declaration is, it's, a, it's actually a letter um, that was sent in 1917, I think, which is one of the really a monument in uh, the Zionist movement that was the Zionist movement back then before Israel, but was really instrumental in seeing the formation of Israel as a state uh, come to fruition. So um, reading about the actual declaration and uh, not just the formation of Israel, but the whole Arab-Israeli conflict is uh, always it seems, unfortunately, a timely matter. So um, that looked interesting, too. And uh, let me turn one thing off really quickly. Okay, I think that did it. Don't want the phone to ring while I'm recording a video. Okay, um, this next one I was actually really fascinated to find, and I don't know why they have books this expensive at half price books. Um, but anyway, I paid uh, pretty much as much as I would ever pay for a book. I think it was ten dollars um, for this because you can never really find this anywhere. Um, I'm sort of a stickler for condition. If I wanted a torn up book, I could go on Amazon and buy one, I guess. But um, anyway, here's what it is. Um, the Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism. 
with uh, a new forward by Derek Bell. This is actually the uh, uh, 20th anniversary uh, edition. I think he came out with it in 1977 and uh, reissued in 1997, of course, or 96. And um, he basically talks about how capitalism has evolved into something that completely mitigates and argues against and contradicts its most basic founding principles. And uh, other than that, I can't tell you too much. I know that uh, Daniel Bell is a very well-known, or was, he actually passed away last year, uh, was a very well-known American sociologist who taught at Harvard for a number of years. And he's written a, a few books sort of in this vein, talking about uh, American uh, cultural economic theory, how the two intertwine, stuff like that. Really fascinated by stuff like this, so I bought it. Next up is another novel, and I almost never read stuff like this, but um, this is Italian crime noir fiction, but another one of those NYRB, if you can, it's uh, The Awful Mess on the, Vir on the Via Miralana, cover, um, with a foreword by Italo Calvino, the other, or another famous Italian novelist. Um, according to a lot of the reviews, this isn't just sort of uh, crime noir, which would be okay in and of itself, I guess, but apparently this has some really um, philosophical overtones, that it's um, really introspective and thoughtful, and that really increased my uh, curiosity even more. So. Um, Anyway, this was this was still a fine. I probably would have bought it anyway, like a dollar or two. Um, and when something looks even vaguely interesting, if it's a dollar, it's coming home. So there you go. Uh, next up, another novel by Evelyn Waugh, um, "Officers and Gentlemen," which is the um, the third novel I think in the Sword of Honor trilogy. I don't have one or two. I've already posted a review of uh, Brideshead Revisited. I have a couple of other WA novels, but uh, Brideshead Revisited, if you haven't read it, do yourself a favor and go read it. It's, it's, a, it's stunningly beautiful. And uh, I think I mentioned in my last, my last haul video, maybe, maybe the one before that, that I had also purchased uh, Scoop which is a novel about, uh, a more novel, novel in a more comic vein about a journalist and the, the world of journalism. So I might have to get volumes one and two before I read that one. We'll see how that goes. Next up, something that's not a novel. Um, it's called uh, Anthropology and Anthropologists, The Modern British School by Adam Cooper. I've actually um, read a book by Adam Cooper before. He, he is, as you can probably tell, a professional anthropologist. And I think the book I read before is called uh, The Anthropology of Culture, or something very closely related to that. Um, he wrote this before the other book, so of course it's not listed uh, in the front. But um, he basically just talks about, you know, the, the canonical British anthropologists of the 20th century. Um, uh, Melanowski, um, uh, Radcliffe Brown, um, well, uh, Levi Strauss wasn't, wasn't British, but um, certainly did belong to the 20th century. Um, and talks about, you know, uh, colonialism, functionalism, structuralism, neo-structuralism, uh, the relationships between ethnography and theory, and all that good stuff. It's obviously somewhat uh, of a technical book and going to put you to sleep if you're not interested in uh, 
the history of anthropological theory, but I am. So um, that looked interesting. Um, this next one is something I, I'm afraid I don't read enough of, but it was also a deal, a dollar, I think. Already took all the price tags off, so I can't say for sure. But um, it's a it's a literary biography of Ezra Pound, that crazy crazy man, Ezra Pound. Uh, it's called the Solitary Volcano, a biography of Ezra Pound by John Tittle, or Title, Title. Well, okay. Um, was actually uh, published in 1987 and nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. I didn't even know that when uh, I picked it up. It's one of those books that you sort of always see sitting on the discount shelf, so you think it's going to be really awful when you buy it. <laughs> but, um, and maybe it is really awful. I've read some Pulitzer Prize nominated books that were horrid, but um, I was pleasantly surprised to find that it had been uh, nominated for something that was halfway important. Okay, next up uh, are two of those older penguin covers. Um, you know, sort of the blue, the sort of an interesting looking vintage book. But uh, this is by uh, a woman I'd never heard of with a recognizable last name. Her name is Elspeth Huxley. And she wrote a book called The Flame Trees of Thicca memories of an African childhood and uh, it's a, basically about her growing up in Kenya I, th I think it was on a coffee farm actually uh, which might sound very very familiar um, almost like Isaac Dennison who was uh, another woman who grew up on a coffee farm in Africa and who wrote uh, Seven Gothic Tales and Out of Africa but I'd never heard of her, and I found it on the discount shelf, and it looked really interesting, so I bought it. Next up, another older penguin. Something a little more recognizable. Um, every time I found this book, it was in such horrible condition that I didn't really want to buy it, or they were asking too much money for it. Uh, you know, six, eight, ten dollars. Um, I found this for a couple of dollars. It's um, by an author I've never read before, but um, of course it's historical, so I'm interested in just sort of reading what he's what he's talking about, and I recognize his name. Um, it's Charles W. Chestnut, and it's called uh, The Marrow of Tradition. It's based on the uh, the the Wilmington, North Carolina massacre that happened in 1898, the so-called race riot that happened there, and um, and it's just sort of one of those really important American historical novels that um, I don't think gets read much anymore. So um, I wanted to try to read it. Next up is a book of history that I think I'd seen on uh, a few history syllabi before. And uh, it's unfortunate how little treatment Eastern Europe gets, I think, and as far as really serious cultural, political um, history, it's especially popular cultural and political history. But... Um, the historian is uh, John Lukacs, who is actually um, was born in the title city of uh, Budapest, and it's called Budapest 1900: A Historical Portrait of a City and Its Culture by John Lukacs. I'm guessing that's how you pronounce his name. Uh, I think the way you pronounce um, the Hungarian-born literary critic uh, Gigori Lukács, I think that's how you pronounce his name, so correct me if I'm wrong. But um, I love the idea of just uh, sort of diving into a city, obviously a city he's probably familiar with since he was born there, but uh, Lukács is still alive, I think he's almost 90 years old, and he's a relatively well-known historian, somewhat of a popularizer 
but um, the back of the book looked lovely. And, um, I opened it up, and, and it, it looks like it could be pretty interesting, so I'll give this a try, too. Oh, goodness. Here's the 10-pounder. The um, Robert Caro is another American historian who's devoted the last... Oh, what's it been? 20, 25, 30 years now of writing a monumental multi-volume biography of Lyndon Baines Johnson. And I think he just came out with volume four earlier this year. And I have volume one and I have volume two, uh, neither of which I've read, but this is volume three. This covers his years in the Senate. And it's called, uh, appropriately enough, Master of the Senate, the years of Lyndon Johnson. And it's, I mean, it's even longer than it looks. It, uh, it, with index and notes and everything, it runs to almost 1,200 pages. So when I get a bit of spare time, <laughs> um, the other ones are, are about the same size, to be honest. But one of these days, I'd like to sit down and read all of them. Um, next is a little tiny novel, another NYRB uh, reprint. It's called uh, Sorrow Beyond Dreams by Peter Handka. Uh, Handka is a, um, a writer that I've read one other thing by... Um, and I'm, of course, blanking on the title, but it has something to do with, um, a goalie at the post, or the anxiety of the goalie at the post. I'm torturing that title, but, um, I wasn't really terribly impressed by it at all, and I haven't posted a, a review of it for that reason. I, I might... But um, this was also discounted, so I thought I would give him another try. Uh, this next book is another biography. I read a book um, by the same author, William Manchester, probably six or eight years ago, and it was called uh, the Wor A World Lit Only by Fire. And it was supposed to be uh, a history of the Renaissance, I believe. And it was maybe one of the worst books of history I've ever read in my entire life. And that's saying quite a bit, because I read a lot of history. But for some reason, a lot of people on Goodreads and other book sites have said quite a bit that's very good about this book. Um which is actually, I don't have the first volume, this is the second volume of William Manchester's biography of Winston Churchill. It's called Churchill Alone, 1932 to 1940. Um, uh, I don't think that he ever, I don't know if he was even intending on publishing a third volume, because, of course, um, Churchill lived to be a very, very old man. He lived into the 1960s, I think. Um, so, I mean, 1940 was not the last year of his life, but it could be that Manchester died or wasn't even intending to write Volume 3, I don't know. But this barely takes us into World War uh, II, and not even uh, America's entrance into World War II. But, uh, again, another uh, chunky biography, well over 700 pages. Uh, got a lot of good reviews um, on... Uh, at least on Goodreads. I haven't even checked on Amazon yet. Okay, just three more. Um, this is actually a book that I read a couple of years ago that um, I have a, a few really great academic libraries here in town that uh, I can go and just check books out of whenever I want to. And uh, on a whim, I uh, read about Perry Miller one day and really wanted to go read something of his. Perry Miller, the a uh, well-known American uh, intellectual historian of early America, uh, colonial and uh, colonial era, 
seven, the 17th and 18th century. So I went, and go, went to go pick up a book and read it. And this is the one. I've already read this. Um, I, I gave it five stars. I raved about it in a review. I haven't posted a review of it on YouTube, but I will, especially if you guys are interested in it. Um, I'll probably do it anyway. This is a spectacular series of essays. It's just wonderful. And you, you might ask why I bought it if I've already read it. I like to own copies of things that I've read. I'm not one of those people that can easily part with books. So um, even if I've read it and will never touch it again, I'll buy it if I got it from a library the first time. But really spectacular. A lot of really interesting history about how Puritan identity and Puritan religion shaped the American experience during the 17th and early 18th centuries. Re really spectacular, thorough, fascinating, uh, intellect intellectual history, not cultural or political, but intellectual history of, of colonial America, which is not really an intersection I've seen a lot of. So it made me want to buy this all the more. <coughs> Next up is um, a book by Jeffrey Burton Russell, who's a religious scholar. Um, he wrote a book called uh, Mephistopheles, uh, The Devil in the Modern World. He actually wrote a series of books like this. Um, he wrote uh, a book called Witchcraft in the Middle Ages, uh, The Devil, Perceptions of Evil from Antiquity to Primitive Christianity, um, Satan in the Early Christian Tradition, and the other one I have of his, I just have two books, this one and uh, one called Lucifer, The Devil in the Middle Ages. So basically what he does is he takes these uh, these books and sort of devotes a time period to each one and looks at how the idea of the devil or Lucifer or Mephistopheles or whatever you want to call him sort of uh, shaped the culture and how people saw him and perceived him and, and, and how they thought that uh, they interacted with him in everyday life. It, it looks really interesting and I'm sort of a completist I knew that it was part of a series, and I knew that I had the one for the Middle Ages, and now I have the one for, it looks like, the modern world. I don't even know where that technically starts for him, but I'll find out. And if I find any of the other ones in the future, I'll certainly pick those up too. Okay, the last one is uh, a book by... Um, a writer, I think one of the last reviews was uh, that I posted on this channel was by this writer. It's Fritz Stern, uh, who you've probably heard me talking quite a bit about. I've read two books by Fritz Stern. Um, one of them is The Politics of Cultural Despair, which was absolutely spectacular. And if you're interested in late 19th century German cultural criticism, uh, and everyone is, right? Uh, you should go pick that up immediately. Um, he's fascinated by his subjects, and it's supremely well written. And then just a few weeks ago, I finished reading um, Einstein's German World, which is sort of a, uh, a look at what science and, and politics and and the social world of Germany were like at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, to be quite honest, it sounded a lot more interesting than it was. It was kind of a, a collection of interrelated essays um, that could have been more interrelated, to be quite honest. But this is one of his older books. Uh, he wrote it in the 70s. And um, 1977. And, uh, you know, ever since he wrote The Politics of Cultural Despair, I'm probably going to buy nearly everything I see by him. Um, it's called Gold and Iron. 
A Golden Iron, Bismarck, Bleichroder, and the Building of the German Empire by Fritz Stern. Bleichroder, by the way, was Bismarck's personal banker. Uh, Bismarck was a notorious anti-Semite, but Bleichroder was Jewish. So you have this sort of interesting premise from the beginning. You have this man whose prejudices, uh, he may, I mean, he had no problem admitting them quite explicitly that he hated Jews. And then his personal banker is Jewish. So that's an interesting sort of way, that's an interesting vignette to pick up out of history and um, obviously write quite a, quite a book out of that, too. Um, this is an older book with a, a nice, well-worn dust jacket, but I'm really fascinated to uh, read what he has to say about this stuff, too. So, if any of that looks interesting, let me know. Tell me what you got for Christmas, and uh, I'll see you soon. Bye.